Thus far, we have established how an ancient army consumes and replenishes supplies. In this video, we'll put these principles into context by discussing how Roman army supply lines and logistics functioned in wartime. One of the ways we'll be doing this is by establishing a model for an army's food and water supply levels. These values can rise and fall over time, but when they run out, an army will no longer be able to perform its duties and is susceptible to being finished off. It is therefore the objective of a good commander to keep their own levels high and those of their enemies low. Caesar is often cited as stating that he conquered his foes by hunger rather than by steel. Military slang for such tactics were known as kicking the enemy in the stomach. Let's now take a look at the supply profiles for various types of armies using our basic model. We can begin with the Roman Legion. These supply levels indicate what can be collected in the field. Additional supplies are then added by the logistics we have discussed in previous videos. Food was the main supply good being transported, but we do also have records of water being transported as well, though comparatively, this value was much smaller. Let's now introduce another army. This will be a stand-in for another major power with a professional army and a fairly well-developed logistical system. In this case, it may be one of the Hellenistic kingdoms. Generally speaking, you would expect them to be able to collect the same amount of supplies in the field as the Romans. When it comes to logistics, they would also have the ability to ship in supplies. For the purposes of this video, I have showed them with a slightly lower logistical supply to give credit to the more robust Roman system. However, take this with a grain of salt as we are speaking in generalities, and this particular comparison is by no means representative of all eras and situations. Next, we have a generic tribal army. In this case, the differences are more stark. Tribal forces were notorious for their lack of sophisticated logistical systems, which forced them to rely heavily on forging, raiding, and pillaging. Generally speaking, their armies could only supply themselves for a brief period, and thus geared their campaigns toward quick action. Some exceptions, of course, did occur. Lastly, I have shown a mounted army, likely from the steppe. Generally, these groups would be living off the land. I've marked them higher for food in this regard because though their horses might require a lot of fodder, they could forage over a wider area and were more habituated to a life on the move. For water, I've marked them a little lower to represent the fact that their mounts really would need to consume a lot of water, and it wasn't that easy to come by. For this generic army, I have not included supplies coming from a logistical system. This is to reflect the idea that steppe forces did not have the infrastructure of settled societies. It should be noted that all of this is only meant to impart general concepts, since reality is far from being so black and white. With that being said, let's see what happens when these armies are placed in different environmental conditions. Here, I have thrown the various armies into winter. Across the board, all forces have taken a hit to their ability to live off the land. The generic tribal army suffers more acutely because its non-professional warriors rarely operated outside of the campaigning season when they could not afford to leave their homes. This demonstrates the advantage of a logistical system in that it gives your army an additional source of supply with which to carry on its activities. If you can attack while your enemy can't, that's a huge advantage. Logistics also allow you to traverse tough terrain where living off the land proves difficult. This includes crossing notoriously treacherous regions, such as deserts. Here, a mounted army might also be able to survive without supply lines, due to its mobility, which negated some of the attrition. Now that we have shown how this model of supply behaves against various environmental factors, let's see what happens when armies face off. We will begin by dropping a legion into the wilderness to see what happens. Simply put, if it does nothing, it dies. As human biology dictates, Death from lack of water would come before death from lack of food. An army would therefore seek to prevent this by collecting food and water from its surroundings. But as these ran out in the immediate surroundings of an army, its foragers would have to search further and further afield. At a certain point, diminishing returns kick in and an area can just no longer support an army at all. It is now that the army would be forced to relocate and begin to forage again. This is the basic routine, which occupies much of the time of an army living on campaign. Now let's set up two armies in the field and have them advance on one another. They will both approach through the fog of war, collecting supplies along the way. But once armies get close and scouts locate their foes, the forces would generally slow and size each other up. 
Commanders would then try to find ways to gain some advantage in the coming battle. With the army so close, it would be difficult to disengage cleanly, and thus, they might remain in close proximity for days. During this time, foraging expeditions of both armies would be forced to range further and further away. At some point, they might even cross paths as the orbits of both armies began to collide. This situation was very common, and was something that would be used to gain an advantage. Each army would attempt to gain an edge by undermining its opponent's forgers and win the Battle of Attrition. This might be done directly with an attack on forgers. Such actions could be brutally effective. During the First Punic War, for instance, Romans besieging Agrigentum had dispersed to collect supplies, only to be set upon by a Carthaginian force which sallied out to meet them. The legions suffered heavily and were almost completely routed. To guard against such disasters, it became common for foragers to go about their duties with battle equipment at the ready, and with sizable troop detachments watching over them. Cavalry were particularly handy in defense, and sometimes entire legions were deployed to collect supplies safely. This was true of other armies as well. When Hannibal was in Italy during the Second Punic War, he was known to routinely deploy one-third of his force for foraging and use the remaining two-thirds for cover. Good security measures were always a prudent decision. A clever commander would also attempt to minimize their risk by behaving unpredictably, sending out their foragers at different times and by different routes to avoid ambushes. What developed between two armies in close proximity was therefore an intricate game of cat and mouse. This opening dance is often overlooked by most history books which jump directly to the battle itself, but I find this kind of pre-battle joust quite fascinating. In fact, they could often be very deterministic of the outcome of the set-piece battle before it even began. There would be a myriad of ways to fight this tug of war over resources before a main battle. Examples include the poisoning of water supplies, the burning of fields, and the use of fortifications to protect or deny foraging. The showdown between Caesar and Pompey at Dyrrhachium is a prime example of how such a situation could quickly escalate into something like the deadlock of the First World War battlefield. It might also be the case that the skirmishing over resources could precipitate a battle as more and more forces from either side were fed into the point of contact to try and tip the battle into their favor. This is apparently how the famous Battle of Pydna began during the Third Macedonian War. Now let's go back and consider how things might unfold differently if we factor in supply lines. In this example, we will pit a legion against a Gallic army. Here we see that both armies are in close proximity. The Roman army, however, is able to minimize its need to forge by drawing more supplies from its supply line. This makes it more resilient to attacks on its forgers as compared to its opponents. So now that we have established how supply lines could help mitigate the dangers faced while forging, we can turn to examine the threats faced by the logistical system itself. As we mentioned in our previous video, Roman logistics used various bases to help bring supplies to an army. Let's first consider threats to the waterborne supplies coming from the strategic base. Early on in Rome's history, when it did not control the Mediterranean, this was a real problem. During the First Punic War, for instance, the Carthaginian blockade imposed on Sicily greatly hampered the Roman army's ability to campaign on the island. Such was the magnitude of this threat that the Romans ultimately resolved to raise their own fleet to protect their ship convoys and contest the Punic navy at sea. During the Second Punic War, the Roman navy would impose its own blockade on Hannibal in Italy to cut him off from support. This did much to prevent him from gaining the necessary force to overthrow the Republic. As time went on, Rome's naval power faced less and less organized opposition. And yet, military forces without a proper navy might still attempt to hamper the Romans by employing pirates or privateers to harass their supply lines. More serious challenges occurred in instances of civil war when Roman turned on Roman. As an example, in 48 BC, Caesar found himself cut off while in Greece by a Pompeian blockade that nearly brought him to his knees. Let's now consider the next link in the logistical system, the operational base. This could also face attack by a determined enemy. During the Second Punic War, Publius Cornelius Scipio famously turned the tide of the Spanish theater of war by striking directly at the heart of enemy operations at New Carthage. 
By seizing the city in a lightning strike, he robbed the enemy of huge amounts of supplies and severely undermined their position. Many commanders would attempt similar moves to deal decisive blows in their campaigns, whilst guarding against the same being done to them. Caesar's operations in Greece against Pompey, for instance, reached a climax as both sides fought over the critical port of Dyrrhachium. But more often than not, attacking the strategic or operational base was too much to ask for most armies. As a result, they might choose to attack the land-based supply line which stretched all the way to the army. This was often the weakest link in the logistical system. Let's now consider this leg of the system by considering a Roman army moving through a generic region. As it advances, it builds camps, establishes garrisons, and forges a path for the supply line to follow. An enemy could attack these by targeting the supply depots. It would be up to a Roman commander to judge the risk of such an attack and reinforce the positions by leaving behind a sufficiently large garrison and building up their fortifications. The walls and soldiers were often enough to dissuade direct attacks. In addition, it was a good idea for commanders to prevent these attacks in the first place. This could be done by subduing a region militarily as the army passed through, by negotiating peace, or outright paying for security. When looking at Roman armies on large campaigns, it is often the case that they will spend significant time securing their rear before advancing for such reasons. This occurred during the first Jewish revolt when much of Judea was suppressed before the legions finally turned to their ultimate objective of taking Jerusalem. Failure to do so could result in fairly costly attacks. Despite all these precautions being taken, it might still be possible for an enemy to target a supply line as it leapfrogged between bases. One such tactic would be to lie in wait along the likely line of supply. However, achieving success was easier said than done. The ambushing force could never be sure when a convoy might arrive. As they waited, they would have to gather their supplies and thus risk being discovered and themselves destroyed, which was a risky gamble to take. If it worked, however, they could wreak significant havoc. A prudent Roman commander would be expected to provide escorts for supply convoys based on the anticipated threat level. In times of peace or low danger, as little as a single century might be detached to accompany a shipment of grain and weapons. In wartime, a cohort or more might be assigned as defense. A tribune might even be given command of the escort forces along with a large body of soldiers to ensure their safe passage through particularly dangerous areas such as the forests of Germania. These troops would establish a defense cordon around the slow moving wagons. Cavalry and light troops were used as screens with the heavy infantry taking position in close order along the sides of the formation. Often, natural terrain might be used as a defense and troops would be shifted to guard the most vulnerable side of the formation. The biggest threat to such a convoy was a mobile force of cavalry that could strike quickly and violently. This was one of the preferred tactics of the Parthians and proved to be a huge thorn in the side of the Romans operating against them. In such eastern campaigns, a Roman commander would have to dedicate a large portion of troops to defend their supply lines. Failure to do so would be devastating. This is evidenced by Antony's campaign, where he was forced to retreat when a Parthian raid destroyed his rear baggage train carrying valuable equipment such as artillery. There will be countless more facets of logistics to discuss in the future, but for now we will wrap up our talks. I find this topic truly fascinating and I'm so glad that you all share in my enthusiasm. I hope that we have been able to provide you with some valuable additional context for how warfare was fought back in the day and how it even continues to be fought to this day. Thank you all for watching. See you next time.